Hello again. In our last lecture, we talked about some properties, gave you a definition of covert channels. We're going to explore that a little bit further in this lecture. Right, but let me just remind you that a covert channel is a path for the illegal flow of information within a system uh, between subjects utilizing system resources that were not designed to be used for intersubject communication. Right, so the examples we've looked at, you know, we've been sending one bit of information from, say, P to Q, even though we're not supposed to be able to communicate P to Q. Well, you might say one bit of information, who cares about that? Well, in, in realistic scenarios, uh, covert channels can be used to send hundreds, thousands, or even millions of bits of information. Uh, and so it becomes a real problem. Okay. So if we're, if we're talking about a covert channel, what is it that we care about? Well, we really care about three things. First of all, existence. Is there a covert channel there or not? And it would be nice to be able to examine a system systematically and decide whether there are covert channels there or not. Second, how big is the channel? What's the bandwidth? Or what's the throughput of the channel? How much information can be sent over that channel in a given amount of time? And finally, is the channel noisy or noiseless? Last time we talked about a channel um, which involved two uh, processes which were being scheduled one after the other back and forth in a round robin scheduling. And we said you could send information by the timing information. Well, if you had 20 or 30 or 100 processes being scheduled that way, the channel would be so noisy that it might be very difficult to extract the information. And so sometimes a channel may be there but it may have so much uh, static on it that it's difficult to, to figure out what's being said. It's usually infeasible in most realistic systems to eliminate all channels, uh, but we want to at least know that they're there. Okay, so if you find a channel, what do you do about it? Well, you can sort of imagine that you might do three things. You might eliminate the channel by changing the system implementation. You might reduce the bandwidth of the channel by introducing noise into the system. However, you might want to do that. Or you might monitor the channel to see if anybody is actually using it. This last method is called intrusion detection. And so if you know a particular channel is there, as long as no one is exercising it, no problem. But if you notice uh, anomalous behavior on that channel, then you might you know, audit that or close the channel or do something else. Okay, so let's ask what must be true for there to be a covert storage channel. Well, the picture shows it pretty well. Remember, you've got a high-level process and a low-level process, and the high-level process is modulating or, or modifying some system attribute, and the low-level process is observing this somehow. And so it has got to be the case that both the sender and the receiver have access to some com attribute of a shared object. And it's got to be the case that the sender has some way of, of affecting the value of that attribute, and the receiver has some way of sensing or viewing the changes in that attribute. And then finally, there has to be a way for the two processes to uh, coordinate their activities so that um, the lower level process or the receiver will know when the higher level process has made a change. Well, what changes if you have a, a, a covert timing channel? Well, not much. Again, both the sender and the receiver have to have access to some attribute of a shared object. They also have to have access to something which is a time reference, like the real-time clock or the ordering of particular events within the system or something like that. And once again, the sender has to be able to control the timing of events taking place on, with respect to that attribute. And the sender has to be able to uh, sense the difference in, in time or in sequencing or something like that. And so there has to be a, a mechanism, once again, by which both of them uh, sequence their activity so that they coordinate and, and can effectively pass information. OK, so what have we? Uh, what have we learned in this lesson? Well, the, the characteristics that we care about for a covert channel are, does it exist, what's the bandwidth, and is it noisy or is it noiseless? Where noiseless would mean that the information flows without any 
uh, without any modification or interruption. Um, dealing with a covert channel, if we find one, may mean eliminating it by changing the implementation, uh, restricting the bandwidth by introducing noise into the channel, or by monitoring it to see if anyone's actually using it. And then finally, there are certain conditions which we listed, four conditions which have to hold for a, for a covert storage channel to exist, and a related, very close, very analogous set of conditions which have to hold for a covert timing channel to exist. Thank you.